Greetings folks, welcome back to my little corner of the library. Today on the show we're going to be discussing a place that has piqued the curiosity and wonder of anyone that's traveled from Poughkeepsie to New York City by train. Now my name is Dan, you're watching Hometown History, and today we're going to Palapel Island, the home of Bannerman's Island Arsenal. Francis Bannerman VI was born in Dundee, Scotland on March 24, 1851. He emigrated to the U.S. in 1854, his family ultimately settling in Brooklyn. When war broke out in 1861, his father, Francis Bannerman V, enlisted in the Union Army. Young Francis VI was forced to quit school and earn a living to support his family. One of the ways he did so was by using an old anchor as a grappling hook, uh, attempting to fish out old bits of rope or used bits of chain from the harbor of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and reselling these items to make money. The fledgling business was fairly successful, and when Bannerman V came home in 1865, the two men started a store together, what's considered to be one of the first military surplus or Army-Navy stores. In 1871, Bannerman VI went off with his father's blessing to open his own military surplus store. Though the heart of the business remained military surplus, Bannerman initially sold produce and hardware as well. The business would continue to grow, Bannerman would go through several stores, eventually moving to Manhattan, and ultimately settling at 501 Broadway. At this point, he now sold exclusively military supplies, and even maintained a military museum in the upper floors of his store, which he referred to as the Museum of Lost Arts. Now, the year was 1898. The Spanish-American War had just ended, and Bannerman had managed to buy up almost 90% of leftover military supplies, which left him with a bit of a problem. He had always stored his excess supplies in a warehouse in Brooklyn, but now, with this new influx of material, he was storing a significant amount of black powder. I don't know if you can imagine attempting to store a large cache of black powder in a warehouse in Brooklyn, but the neighbors did not take to it then any better really than they would today, thus leaving Bannerman with the problem of finding another place to store it all. Now, Palapel Island was a small island, just north of the Hudson Highlands in the middle of the Hudson River, a little bit below Beacon and Newburgh. Story goes that Bannerman first saw it on a boating trip and sent his son David to investigate and look into seeing who owns it. In 1900, Bannerman was able to buy the island from Mary G. Taft for $1,600. In 1901, Bannerman contracted with a local firm in Beacon to build two structures on the island. One, a large rectangular warehouse, and two, a small house for a superintendent. The original warehouse was simply meant to be a large rectangle, three stories, but in Bannerman's uh, eccentric style, he began to put uh, turrets on it and trim, making it look a little bit more like a, a medieval castle. The original castle was still very simple, just being a three-story block building. Once construction was complete, Bannerman whitewashed the walls, and in what can only be described as a stroke of genius for the eccentric businessman, who was also mm, something of a showman, he did something that would carry his legacy down through generations. He put his name on it. Now, the original billboard was uh, much more complicated than the one today. It had uh, Bannerman's name, sure, but it also had the name of the business, Bannerman Sons Incorporated, as well as the address. Thus, anyone going on the train line, on the Hudson Line, at the west side of the Hudson River at that time, so still is, you can see Bannerman's Island Arsenal, and you could see the address where, in Manhattan, patrons could go to actually visit the business. Over the next 18 years, Bannerman would expand what would now be referred to as Bannerman's Castle. A bigger business meant bigger facility to store his goods. He would continue to design the building himself, often doing it on stationery of hotels he was staying at. He would give these drawings to his architect, who would then convert them into actual plans. Now, Bannerman drew inspiration from uh, Scottish castles, very proud of his Scottish heritage, as well as Moorish castles, thus making the Bannerman Castle a sort of cornucopia of, of European ideas. By 1905, the business had grown to the point where Bannerman needed not only a bigger facility to store his goods, but a bigger dock to be able to park large bar larger barges to fill up with supplies to carry them down the river to the city. Unfortunately, as he tried to get uh, the water rights around the island, New York State would only sell them to him if he could mark his property lines. Thus, in 1905, Bannerman began to sink barges around the island, forming a breakwater, which he would ultimately build pathways and entrance towers on, making it a very elaborate harbor for his very elaborate warehouse. 
In 1908, Bannerman would start construction on the south side of the island of a residence where him and his family could stay during the summers. By 1910, he had pathways between the residence and the, uh, the warehouse, the castle. He had gardens designed, he had uh, a grotto uh, built with pathways leading down to it from the residence itself. By the time Bannerman died in 1918, he had expanded the facilities on Palapel Island to include Bannerman's Castle, which had three warehouses, whereas one, two, and three, as well as uh, the most notable feature, the tower. He also had the residence, the harbor, numerous grottos, various uh, places to, uh, so for sort of quiet contemplation, many pathways back and forth across the island, as well as elaborate gardens. In what can only be described as a very eccentric touch, he had also, at the uh, entrance to the main harbor, designed a sally port, uh, which included a working drawbridge and portcullis. Now, all of these features would combine to uh, form what subsequent generations of his family who would stay on the island would describe as living in a fairy tale. So what happened? How did the island go from this idyllic fairy tale scene to the ruins that it is today? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. Now, it starts, most notably, in 1920. The powder house where he stored black powder was adjacent to the castle, the, the storehouse facilities. And on August 15th, 1920, the powder house exploded. Now, no one's really sure what caused the explosion, but what is sure is that the explosion was very big. Um, it shattered all of the windows, as well as caused some structural damage to the castle facility itself. Uh, it shattered windows in the residence on the south part of the island. It was felt as far away as Poughkeepsie and Beacon. Now, with all of the windows gone out of the castle, the warehouse, all of the goods being stored there were moved down to lower levels. Uh, unfortunately, they never replaced the glass, thus the elements, wind, rain, snow, sleet, ice, all of that, uh, had basically free reign in the castle, thus causing even more deterioration of the warehouse facility. In the construction of the castle itself, Bannerman proved himself to be a, a consummate recycler. Uh, even dating back to his days fishing old bits of rope and chain out of the navy yard, Bannerman would always reuse something if he could, as opposed to buying something new, which is a very admirable trait. However, there are limits. Um, Bannerman would use old railroad ties and old sections of uh, military cots. Uh, he would use the iron bars from them in construction of the castle. Now, while that might seem a good idea, uh, it may have contributed to some of the uh, weakness of the castle facilities itself. Again, it's, none of those materials were really meant to be uh, used for building, so the castle might not have been necessarily as strong as it could have been if Bannerman had used actual building materials. By 1958, the castle had deteriorated to the point where it had to be cleaned out and shut down. And in 1967, the island would ultimately be sold to the people of New York State for parkland. On August 8, 1969, disaster would strike again. A fire broke out in the castle. No one's sure what the cause was, but as a result of lack of water facilities on the island, authorities uh, determined it best to just let the fire burn itself out. There was really no way to get enough water pressure to, uh, to actually put out the fire. After this, all that was left was the walls of the structure itself. All of the internal uh, construction was essentially gone. And over the next few decades, the castle would continue to deteriorate. Another major collapse in 2009 would leave the structure uh, looking much like it does today, with only one uh, and about a third of the walls of the main tower left still standing. However, there is hope. In 1993, the Bannerman Trust was formed. Their mission is to attempt to stabilize the structure, as well as opening up the island as an educational facility, not only about Bannerman, but also about the history of the area itself. As of 2003, the Bannerman Trust even offers tours of the island from May to October each year. I'll put a link in the description below for their website where you can go to, uh, to sign up for tours. Uh, advanced tickets are required. The, the tour that I took was set up through Atlas Obscura as well as the Bannerman Trust, so shoutouts to both of them, uh, much obliged. I would highly recommend going to see it. It's, it's just, it's a really cool place. I first saw it like many people did, uh, taking the train from Beacon down to New York City uh, when, I was, uh, when I was much younger, and it had always been uh, kind of curious about the history of it and how, uh, how it came to be. So to be able to tour it, to be able to go and see it was, was quite a thrill for me. Well, that's about all we've got for you today. Check out the links below for more information. Also, you can pick up a copy of the Images of America book on Bannerman Castle. It's where a lot of the information came from. 
Uh, it is a really cool place to go and visit. I would highly recommend it uh, for anybody that just is interested in history or just uh, cool stuff. Just uh, out of the way places to go uh, and interesting experiences to have. Thanks for watching. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give us a big thumbs up down below. Be sure to hit that subscribe button on your way out so you stay up to date on all our latest videos. We'll see you next time. Thanks for stopping by.